Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Responsible Webinars. Uh, today, we are hosting this webinar on behalf of Responsible Project. And I uh, myself, I am the coordinator of the Responsible Project. My name is Olga, and I am from Action. We're based in France. And uh, today, um, uh, we are happy to have uh, um, several people on uh, our panel. And uh, we are going to talk about the children and the oceans. But before I start, I uh, want to first of all welcome all of our attendants and uh, thank our panelists. And uh, some of you have uh, attended our first webinar, which was oh, now in the beginning of summer. So we had uh, a good uh, uh, holidays, good break. And uh, just like uh, good uh, school children, we started today with uh, talking about doing ocean literacy with children. So for those of you who have um, uh, attended the first webinar, you already know what is uh, ocean literacy and context, why we talk about it. The first webinar was um, uh, talking about also behavior change and what ocean literacy can do for that. But for those of you who haven't uh, attended the first webinar, I will uh, want to remind you a bit of the context of why we're talking about ocean literacy. What is ocean literacy? Because in fact, it's a new term for all challenges. And some of you know it uh, more by the name of awareness raising or capacity building or education. And this term has uh, originated in the US more in the context of the science and education. It has then uh, been mentioned in the Galway statement on the transatlantic cooperation and uh, it finally made it to a bigger agenda and uh, became a focus of several um, research projects of the Horizon 2020. Uh, sea change and responsible, and in fact, uh, also I don't have it on my slide, but uh, uh, also the Aora project is focusing on the ocean literacy. This, um, um, the ocean literacy being on uh, agenda now has changed a lot because it's showing that uh, there is an increasing importance of it for science, education, training, and policy. So you see the term appearing in different, um, in these different fields, and uh, it's uh, calling for uh, increasing ocean literacy to help uh, reaching objectives of marine policy, for, for example, for ensuring blue growth is sustainable and and so on. So in uh, this, uh, this project that I mentioned, they are a big European project which each of them had uh, quite a few European partners from different member states. Um, and we are happy today to have some representatives from also Sea Change with us. Uh, uh, El um, <coughs> Elian, who also um, uh, represent the, the MC organization for the organization for the marine educators and we are also happy to have with us Megan today uh, who is uh, representing the North American uh, um, uh, Organi Association for marine educators so these are just to tell you that these are so so many things uh, happened between uh, uh, America and Europe, how the term travels. A lot of um, these research projects have uh, started and uh, the, the, the ocean literacy has been on agenda for on the policy in many contexts. Um, so now it's, it's really a, a wider uh, implementation as we found it in Europe. So it's, it's not only trying to do ocean literacy if science and education but also reaching the professionals reaching the uh, other uh, fields where we connect to the ocean and uh, we actually were as a starting point uh, in last webinar we also talked about who is uh, the ocean literate person and we have the definition that this is the person who is aware of the importance of the ocean and its current health and also understands the human's influence on the ocean and vice versa and who knows what to do to protect the ocean most importantly 
And uh, in our project uh, in, and in, in the sea change projects, we come to understand it that this in fact is concerns everybody. It's an issue for everyone. It's children, parents, citizens, consumers, professionals, civil society, decision makers, scientists, whatever, all are responsible for the state of the ocean. And uh, we uh, really, uh, today we will be talking about one specific group with children. But again, before I uh, check, uh, before we check, um, uh, get into the context of this webinar, also to remind you what are the objectives of this series. So we will be sharing the views and challenges and best practices. We will discuss collectively how to build more effective ocean literacy in Europe. And we, one of the also main issues would be to identify where do we need uh, further work. Is it uh, with education? Is it with science? Is it the connecting the two? And three, how do we move forward to actually uh, keep the ocean literacy on an on agenda and to find practical solutions? So we would like to, to also widen the European community of practice for all ocean literacy practitioners. So this was just also to remind that we are working with a framework of seven webinars coming every second Thursday of the month, and uh, that uh, the synthesis of webinars will, with all the maybe main messages and things that we discuss, will then bring the input into the final conference of our project that would happen in February next year, and also will find its um, input into the policy making. So now, I hope that everybody is uh, able to hear me, see me, uh, and uh, get a bit familiar with this platform. For those of you who haven't used it before, just to say that uh, all participants are muted as a default, except for hosts and the speakers. And uh, as a participant, what you can do, you can use the question and answer button uh, to ask questions uh, and to provide any comments, contributions, as we talk about the issues. And uh, depending on the uh, time, we might give you the floor, but uh, that really depends on the time. Uh, and I, if there is an issue, please use the raise hand button. And then also specify in the question and answer button your question or contribution. So today we're talking about children and the oceans. What are the opportunities and challenges for ocean education? And uh, today I'm happy to present uh, that we have actually five uh, speakers with us uh, because we, we think that with all these different uh, experiences people have, different hats that they have, they can share very interesting examples and experiences with you and inspire you with the work that they do. So we have uh, with us today, Louise Ras. She's uh, from Aquarium in, in Brest, Sharanopolis, and she's also part of the responsible project. We have uh, Jenny Griffiths. Jenny is an educator and she's uh, with more than 15 years of experience and she works with the Marine Conservation Society. We also have with us today, Celia Gregory. She's working with the Marine Foundation. It's a uh, and also a, it's an it's a art uh, well, um, organization, and she can tell you more about it. Uh, and uh, Celia is working also with us as a partner of Responsible Project. We have, we are very happy also to have with us Megan Marrero from Mercy College. She is uh, um, the president of uh, uh, North American Association of the Marine Educators. and. Uh, She's, uh, she's actually, today she could join us from uh, Ireland where she is a Fulbright Scholar. And we also have with us uh, Elian Bastos. And uh, Elian is uh, working from Marine, for Marine Biological Association. She has also several hats as she works with, uh, worked with the Sea Change Project and she was involved with work uh, developing the Blue Schools initiatives in the UK and other countries. And she is an active member of uh, MCA, the European Marines uh, um, Educators Association. 
So I hope you can see them all, you can wave. I don't, I don't see everybody on the screen, but I continue. So now we would like actually to, to ask you as the audience who we have in the audience today. Because we know we have quite a lot of people today, uh, but we don't know who you are. Are you an educator? Are you an uh, NGO? Are you interested to learn how to, to do interesting things with kids? What kind of hats you have? And uh, now I'm going to launch the poll. Uh, for those of you who, who have used it before, I will, you know it. For those who are new, I will explain. Uh, and I will check. Uh, so you will have a, a pop-up screen where you need to choose one or two things which applies to you. So let's see how it goes. Um, so I'd like to know what, who are you? What type of organization, institution do you pre are you representing? And we have a few minutes for you to start voting, or not the voting, but putting the your vote to tell them who you are. Uh huh. The majority are others so far. Interesting. You, you, you can put several, uh, several categories. We almost finished. Uh, I think there's the last people who are making their decision between the categories. I know it could be tough uh, to see who you, who you are. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think we are... We are almost done. Well, four more people <laughs> could still vote. Uh, something. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you can see that uh, looks like half of half of our audience is chosen the category of others which means it's probably you have more, uh, you, you either work for some other organization that I have, we have identified as the main um, audience, or you have uh, several hats, so you are uh, in one of the categories plus others. So happy to meet all of you, and uh, we, we, we hope you can write us more about where you, which organization you represent after you can use um, also, the, the after webinar, we would have a questionnaire where you can specify a bit more details about you. Okay, so we are going further. And uh, before we launch uh, the question in our panelists, just a quick Thing. Why are we talking about doing ocean literacy with kids? It's very traditional. It's uh, very challenging and rewarding at the same time because when you teach children about the oceans, it's, uh, it's amazing, it's inspiring, it's difficult, it's everything. But um, it's, uh, you have different, different ways to teach it. In the formal education, it's usually covered, uh, the topics are covered in the science classes. But maybe one question here is, is it enough? To cover it only there. there. In the informal education, you also have different, uh, very means of engagement, which is probably more than in, for any group you could use the games, uh, storytelling, field trips, even citizen science. Uh, kids love it. It's uh, I, when I say it's very rewarding because you have a great uh, emotional connection when you when you uh, teach kids about the uh, ocean. And uh, they are so uh, responsive to the stories we tell. Everybody who has their own kids or teach kids know this. Now, there is also those of you who have uh, been in our, um, in, in our previous seminar, we talked a lot about link with the behavior change. And uh, here, 
I just want to mention, of course, you, you, most of you know that there is a, I believe there's a stronger link with the behavior change with kids because they are maybe less uh, um, dependent on the social uh, norms. They are very eager to do something uh, new and they're not yet so much into uh, like um, they're not uh, so confined with uh, different theories that uh, we've discussed last time. Uh, they are they are our future. So when we teach them to take care of uh, the ocean, it's uh, like teaching good manners for the future generations. Now, um, now maybe it's the time that I actually tell you what are we talking to uh, focus our webinar about because. When uh, we discussed uh, with the panel what would be the issues to, to take, uh, we thought that when you're teaching children, you need to know what you teach them and where do you get their knowledge, where, where education, educators get their knowledge, how do they know where to get it, and is what they have now sufficient, what are their needs. The second is maybe most um, um, engaging and interesting in terms of best practices is how do we tell the story to kids. What is effective and what is a, uh, what is not? How much we can uh, um, tell the story? How much we can push things into uh, into action? There, I'm sure many of you who worked with, with the children know the all kind of limitations and challenges. And uh, the third question that we are going to focus today is: we want to discuss. Uh, with the panel and uh, we hear your reactions about what are successful solutions that you found to challenges and what uh, still remains unsolved and thus we need to, to work on in the future. So the first uh, question, where do educators get their knowledge? What are their needs? This is just a small list if it's not complete at all uh, of what kind of places you can get it. And the internet made it easy to reach all of these resources, as many of them are open source. Uh, what I still like to do is I'd like now to know you as an um, educator or other organization, where do you uh, get your information? I launched the, the poll where you would like, I would like you to choose top three uh, sources of where you could get the, your knowledge. So is it uh, some special websites for, the, for educators? Is it something that you taught for ages and uh, you don't need any new information to you use your friends and colleagues? Do you, is there, you take a lot of um, help from other organizations? Still thinking. Okay, almost done. Now we still have a few people who could cast their votes. It's very, it's trying to be very interesting. Uh, okay, last few seconds. Okay, okay you had, I'm gonna close the poll now. Uh, and we can see the results. Surprising or not, uh, educators who are in the audience today 
he used the scientific literature as one of the main, or the, the, these people who choose it as the first uh, top three. Uh, the other main sources would be the Conference of Educators and Workshops and websites for teachers. Friends and colleagues are very high and my very own knowledge. So this is what you've learned yourself in, in your practices and experiences. This is very interesting. Still the category of others, it would be very interesting to hear from you uh, later because it's not possible to type um, uh, an answer, but we would be very interested to know what other things do you use that uh, were not there. Okay, I stop now. And I think now we would like to actually go and um, ask the following questions to our panel. So I, would, I wonder if uh, we can start with Jenny. Jenny, you could uh, comment a little bit on, on this issue of where do educators get their knowledge? What are the challenges? And what uh, what is so specific when when we so i think um, i mean for me hello everyone by the way <laughs> um i think for, for me it would be a combination of all of those areas i wasn't surprised when i saw the results but it's all dependent on um on what resource you're building and what personal knowledge you have so for me i have um i, I come from a teaching background i don't come from a marine background so for the resources I build, I use a lot of scientific literature, but I also work in an organisation that has scientists. So I work heavily with the scientists and I'm, I'm kind of the person between um, the scientists and the educators, I guess. Um, um, but I, I also, if, when we're thinking about the resources that we built in terms of sharing our resources, I would rely quite heavily on websites that I know that teachers use a lot, things like the TES website, the Guardian website, countryside classroom, sites like that that I know that are popular with teachers that I've worked with. Um, and, and a combination of sharing with all this with other organizations as well. I think there's, you know, the, the resources through MC and Responsible and, and other organizations like that are really, really important. So for me it's a combination of of all of those things. I wouldn't I couldn't possibly say that one was my priority over and above another because I think we need to do everything as a, a multi approach to things so that we're getting our resources shared and we're getting the information and the knowledge shared. So that would be my perspective on it. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, could everybody hear Jenny well? Was it okay for the panel? Okay, there was a bit of echo for me. Uh, I hope that everybody else could hear you well. But uh, thank you, thank you, thank you very much for your input. I wonder now if, uh, Megan, you can uh, add anything to this perspective as uh, having the several hats uh, of uh, being a teacher, being uh, uh, in the um, association for, for the marine educators and seeing all this experience of different people. Um, yeah, I, I agree with Jenny. I think that um, we, we don't limit ourselves right to one particular resource or one particular avenue for resources. Um, I think something that's come up a lot in recent years um, is that teachers that I've worked with, so I'm primarily a, a teacher educator in my what's my day job hat, um, and the teachers that I've been working with really like to um, engage with scientists through associations and also through social media and um, videos and, and blogs. So I think like some of how people are getting information has changed a bit in recent years because there's, as you noted, there's so much available online and now there's more opportunity for direct communication between scientists and educators, um, even those educators who don't necessarily work directly with scientists. So I think there's a lot of opportunity through social media and through the um, organizations. Thank you, Megan. That's, that's a, a very good clarification of the other things that uh, uh, was not on our poll, that it's true that social media is quite a, a powerful um, tool for all, for, for us and for educators as well. So a lot of things do come from news as we think of some of the subjects on marine uh, science and 
health of the ocean changing so rapidly that uh, in uh, in one two years it's uh, going completely from being not known to at least knowing much more um, i wonder if uh, now other panelists could uh, react what they chose well, if, if they were participating in the poll what would they choose maybe uh, elian or celia you Yes. Yeah, I mean, so I think that um, EV is a huge source of uh, knowledge. Um, my thing would be David Attenborough's Blue Planet 2 has had probably one of the biggest impacts on marine knowledge, um, particularly in the UK. I don't know how it's spread out through Europe, but I mean, it even caused the Queen of England to, to ban um, plastic straws in the palace. So I think that's a good example. <laughs> okay, and Elian, from your perspective, um, I think the main sources um, that, I, that I would consider have already been um, um, mentioned. Um, like, like Jenny, I work in a, in a research organization, so I have first-hand uh, access to, uh, to up-to-date and detailed information that, that it's our job as educators to break down and uh, make it more easily digestible. Um, to to other audiences um but uh, I, I would really emphasize that uh, uh, other panelists have touched already that uh, this um there's a lot of information out there and teachers need to and educators need to to find a way of um sifting tr through um all this information and more and more i think teachers do look for uh direct input from um, experts and knowledge uh, and, and scientists in this case in the field by either inviting to, as guests to, to deliver a session in schools or attending open days that are research organizations or outreach education organizations like us have to offer. Uh, also because you know that there shouldn't be too much pressure on the educator to know everything about everything so if we um, make this community uh, big and accessible sharing all our different expertise um, it makes it easy for everyone and and that's why something like um, the National Marine Educators Association or the European Marine Science Educator Association uh, can play really a, a really strong role bringing people together and sharing. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Elian. I think you, you, you brought up uh, the few points that um, I was trying to mention, but I'm happy you all mentioned it, that the, the biggest challenge is how to, which sources we trust, we, how to find between all of uh, the resources available. It also could be a question of um, time, of what is available, or what we're, our habits, what we used to do. And uh, maybe this is something we can also touch with the next question, uh, when uh, we discuss, like, how do we, how do we teach? Because a lot of new methods and new tools have been available in the last, uh, maybe, five, ten years when internet appeared, and some of the teachers who were teaching the ocean issues to the children, they, they come from even before that era. And uh, so many things appear in every day that it's very difficult to keep track of things. So, for example, here we're not going to try to tell what are the different things that people should use, but rather we discuss what are the, how they better use it. What is the approach? Is there something that uh, we need to change, reorganize on the different level so for for example uh, is, is uh, what exists in the science is this enough uh, to teach um, like is this the subjects that we want to teach or is do we like to so focus more on the connecting our daily life uh, of us our children our families those who live close to the sea or not to the health of the ocean i think it's a uh, uh, it's taught in some places, it's taught in the maybe informal education. It is not uh, yet very common in any subject in the school that I know of. Correct me if I am I'm, um, I'm wrong. Um, 
uh, with uh, with the feedback kind of from our uh, experience within Responsible, I've really noticed that there's been um, working in an aquarium. We do a lot of ocean literacy, but more general scientific knowledge about the ocean and what is happening to it, how it functions. On the other hand, there's a very little um, sustainable ocean literacy that is done in these science classes. We don't talk about sustainability. We don't talk about behavior. We don't talk about human interactions with the ocean, which is something that we've been doing within the Responsible uh, mm -hmm. project, which changes things uh, radically, I find. So it's a different way of teaching things, but also with different objectives, going mm -hmm. past the idea that just knowing about something will give you the tools to protect it or to do something about it but rather try to show that there are also ways to act, that there are levels at which uh, even a, a teenager or a, um, or a school child, a child could, could actually intervene and do something. Uh, which, so that changes approach, I think. Yeah, thank you very much for, for continuing on that topic because I think there are these two issues, uh, what we teach, where we get knowledge and how and once we we know maybe where we need to adjust things that's maybe we would know what do we need to develop to support this uh, I think we need to move to my next question and uh, I just if you bear with me for a second I will try to uh, move to the next question, which was how, how do we tell the story to kids? And uh, it's true, there are amazing new many ways how we can get them to learn about the oceans. The most uh, probably exciting and inspiring thing uh, ab about the, all, the, all the creatures, all the fairy tales, everything. How do we teach it? What do we do? Um, there are there are many venues and things that uh, we can we can best is probably to take them to the ocean and and to attend the aquarium or to uh, nowadays there's a virtual reality things i uh, ask now the audience again if um, I, I hope they're still uh, not asleep uh, to participate in uh, our next poll where we would like to ask you what uh, do you think is the most effective way to uh, teach children when you work with them? So you have again uh, three, you need to choose three top because there, are, of course, you cannot just do one all, all the time. There are many. Still, we would like to get a bit of a sense what do you think works? What are the issues there? So I start the poll, it should pop up on your screen. And I wait for your answers. So you have, uh, we put the categories as storytelling and books, films, animations, games, including computer games, board games, computer games, participatory activities. So that's when you actually do something together with kids. Uh, some people stress that doing things together as a family activity is very effective. A lot of people mentioned field trips and we, I did put a virtual reality on the uh, on list thinking maybe some of you have used it already and found the, whether it was effective or not. And last not the least uh, is the art. Because the ocean theme is, is quite uh, uh, important in art and I think maybe in um, after we finish this, uh, <coughs> we will hear from uh, from Celia about how they could use art in the education. Okay, we are almost done. And uh, you have last chance. Uh, you can choose several. Okay. 
and I close the poll and I share with you what our audience think about it. So not a surprise, but the participatory activities were one the top. And uh, most, uh, most of you thought that these were the most effective. The next ones were field trips and storytelling, followed by films, activities with family, uh, and art and others. Virtual reality did not gain that many. However, still, still, uh, still positive. Okay, and uh, we continue. And um, now, now I wanted to actually ask uh, our panelists also to share what did they use in their work because they have tremendous experience. And just to highlight some of the. Um, activities that they did and to tell what was effective and maybe maybe just one word about if there if it was something challenging so I uh, I ask now Louise to share the experience what they did uh, in Oceanopolis and uh, how did they engage kids and how was it effective Louise the floor is yours thank you uh, hi hello again um, so uh, I would have two examples for today. One uh, is very, very short, just saying that in uh, at Oceanopolis, the aquarium where I work, uh, we have every year a program, a project called Young Reporters of Science and Art. And in this program, we really try to mix science and art. And you can see it's been going on for 10 years and there are ever more classes participating. And within Responsible, we've studied, we've tried to do an assessment of whether this brings behavioral change or if this teaches students more than another program would. And uh, so far it looks like it does. It, uh, it brings affect into the equation. So not just being in relation with scientists, not just doing uh, scientific uh, reasoning and, and learning, uh, but also then trying to do a restitution in the end where they put it in form of a play or, or a dance or, or a painting and they do whatever they want basically. And, uh, and this is, always quite successful. And then uh, also within the Responsible Project, uh, we had to, we um, proposed a, an event at World Ocean Day in Paris. And for this event, uh, we had a major challenge was how to make Responsible attractive because there was WWF uh, with uh, virtual reality and people were queuing up to go put on these new glasses and try new technologies. Uh, there are others with very big visual things, uh, ex ex uh, polar expeditions with beautiful films. And we had to, as a European research project, <laughs> try to attract people and have people come. And so we thought, well, what do people want? What do schools want when they come? What do classes want? And the general public as well, because there were the two. And uh, our answer was, well, people want to have fun in general. Um, and so I have a few photos of what we did. We created a game. So I'll, I'll share my screen if that's okay, Olga. Um, so uh, yes, there it is. Um, so yes, so we created this uh, game uh, that we called The Ocean and Me, where you have a Velcro ball on the uh, poster that you see in the back. You have uh, Velcro targets for each subject. And so like that, we had someone throwing a ball and that attract, also attract attention uh, in the room. So people came because they were really curious. And then we tried to take intriguing questions with a living lab approach where we had people come and ask questions and then we'd find the answers and put them in the game cards. So this brought us very strange questions like, uh, are there more fish? Oh no, sorry, um, I'm messing things up here. Uh, <laughs> Uh, are there more fish uh, or humans on the planet? Um, and just questions that people could ask. And uh, we, we got a lot of people who came like that, who came to us, who seemed to enjoy uh, what we were offering. Classes enjoyed it as well. Uh, we had this little boy who was throwing this ball all day with us. We couldn't get him to stop. And the other challenge was we really had to try to adapt our language between uh, five-year-olds and adults. And so this was also something that was a really intriguing experience. And you can see in the last photo, a lot of people did end up coming and we had 
not quite as many people as the people with the virtual reality, but uh, we still managed to attract and create dialogue. And I think people learned a lot. So being having fun is important, I'd say, in ocean literacy. <laughs> Um. Hello. Yes. Uh huh. Thank you. Thank you very much, Louise. It's. Uh, I think there are a few questions flying around. If people can get some more information, so it. Uh, yeah, I'm having. You, you will find it available. Uh, now I think that our time is running out, so I will now ask uh, also. Celia, uh, also from the Responsible Project now, this is a bit of an advertisement to show what we have, uh, what she has done using the art approach and doing the workshop with children. Hi, so yes, yeah, so it's interesting because I come from an art background, um, so it was a unique perspective, um, although I did, um, I was a dive master and ended up doing a lot of kind of international projects, so a lot of my experience was actually in the sea with the animals. So. Um, the project that we're doing is for under eight, so we're dealing with very, very young children. So um, we're not really trying to kind of affect big changes because they're so young, but what ultimately we're trying to do is, is nurture a sense of kind of wonder and appreciation for the sea. Um, I very much like Jacques Cousteau's quote, which is that we protect what we love. So we're doing this um, through a, a narrative. Um, we've created a kind of character. We've got a little mermaid and um, some other creatures. And we um, take the kids using visuals. We find by using really amazing photographs as well that this encourages children to feel inspired, um, especially kids that don't necessarily find the kind of word alone so easily to access. And then we take the children on a, on a journey. And this involves lots of questions and answers so the kids are constantly being incorporated. And I just think we, we, we create a kind of sense of excitement and a real sense of kind of appreciation and love. You know, we really believe that if you create this feeling, it's not necessarily so kind of, you can't kind of calculate the numbers, but you're nurturing a kind of essence which we think is vital for creating this feeling of admiration and love which will make you want to protect it. Um, there is lots of evidence to suggest that um, the arts can address the emotional and imaginative connections missing in much environmental education. This comes from making creative connections written by the task force for children's learning. So what we do, we then encourage a creative activity in the middle so that the kids kind of come and draw and this is a practice that kind of goes through human beings ever since the beginning of time, which is that you sit, you chat, you do something with your hands and you start to talk and share and, and explore information and data in a, in a very, very different way. Um, once we've really absorbed the children into the moment, we then present some of the more complex issues of the environmental with this particular with response we're dealing with overfishing. We like to offer this information up in this very safe environment. We feel that young children are experiencing a lot of emotion, environmental stress without necessarily really having a safe environment from within which to learn about this. I mean, in the, and actually at the end, what we then do is we, we do a standing circle and we go around the group and we actually ask each child to express how they're feeling about this. We really feel that again, by having their personal ability to express what they feel is also really valuable. So yeah, that's a little insight into what we're doing. Thank you, Celia. That, that's, uh, again, your, your, um, what you say really re um, reference with what uh, Louise is saying, that once you engage people, engage kids into something, they're really eager to learn. They're really eager to follow your conversation, to, to ask more questions and to lead to very new things even for educators. Now, I wanted to know, I know that uh, Megan uh, had an interesting experience also trying to engage children or younger adults in a, even a, a different uh, um, way they, of the game. It's more of being, I guess, a, a researcher yourself. Can you tell us more about it, Megan? Sure. So one of the projects I worked on um, was all about getting kids to use authentic ocean data. Um, and so this is something I've been researching a lot in recent years as to how students feel about looking at real information. There's so much real ocean data online. So I'm just going to show you a quick example um, where kids are able to actually track, um, follow the tracks of animals. Sorry, there we go. Um, 
and see where animals go and make discoveries much like the scientists. So sort of like what Celia was saying in terms of like making an emotional connection, they do it in a different way through science, which is kind of interesting. So what we're looking at here is um, uh, the map of a track of a basking shark. And you can see the, the shark was hanging out off the coast here. And what we asked the kids to do is to look at the track of the animals, but look at it with respect to different types of ocean data. So here's an example of bathymetry or seafloor topography and try to come up with explanations. Why would this animal be hanging out along where you see these seamounts, where you see these changes in elevation on the seafloor? And those of us who know a little bit about ocean science, we know that that means that there's water movement and there's often a lot of food availability. And if you're a basking shark opening your huge mouth to suck in all of that good, uh, good food, where the water movement, where there's upwelling really matters. And those are the kinds of discoveries that kids can make. And so I've done a lot of um, interviews with kids and teachers over the last few years about this idea of looking at real information and making real discoveries. And it's really um, very, empowerful, very empowering to children to be able to do that, to do themselves. Like there's a lot of value to them in being the scientist and using those scientific practices on their own and, and finding things out and figuring it out. And yeah, it's hard and no, we don't know if that's right. And I think giving kids those opportunities um, is really valuable. And there's so many, I mean, this is a website that I use, which is um, here, but there are many other websites online now where you can follow animals. You can follow sharks and penguins and sea turtles and all these other animals and get kids thinking about different ocean processes and hence increasing their, um, their ocean literacy along the way. Thank you, Megan. I think it's very inspiring to some people who don't know about it and uh, a lot of our audience may, may take a note of it. And I think you have a very important message to the all educators community that uh, making uh, our uh, younger, younger, younger uh, children be feeling like they are researching, they are finding the solution. This is the one way forward. And I think the audience is discussing that it's the, the, the children should be asking the questions yeah. uh, because some things already known to them, uh, which are obvious, we don't need to teach them anymore. But there are other questions that ourselves, we don't know the questions. So it's an interesting way to, to look at how, going back to my question first, where do we get our knowledge? Well, maybe it's, uh, it has to drive the other way around. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much for that. Um, I think I'm running a bit uh, uh, late on my schedule, but so I will now try to move to my third question, which is really related to what we're talking about and sharing different experience. Just also before I do this, I just want to say to the audience that if you'd like to share your experiences, please do this. In a, you can do it in a different way. You can send us um, your email, email. You can uh, also react in the form that, that, will, uh, that will pop up after this webinar is finished, or you can also uh, engage with all of the panelists that we can continue uh, working on this subject. So uh, if I go back to, um, the, tuck, tuck, and I have, the last question, which is again, as I say, very related to what, what we have found as solutions. Some of them you just heard from the panelists and what remains uh, unsolved and what are the things that we need to focus on our future efforts. So do, uh, what do we need uh, to change also to better support uh, our ocean education? What, um, what are the main things you notice from your work that uh, why some of the things you develop and you propose are not yet getting their way easily to, let's say, to, to be in reality. So here I maybe want to ask um, Elian to share what uh, she's been working in, uh, in a sea change and uh, working with introducing and developing the blue schools because I think this is a very interesting uh, initiative, and it is, and uh, the, um, if Elian, you can tell a bit about it to those who don't know about it, and to see what was the main issues that come out of 
of uh, your work. Bear with us. Okay, thank you, Olga. Um, and hi again, everybody. So Blue Schools was a, uh, an initiative that uh, Sea Change put forward. So Sea Change was a European uh, wide project, a sister project, we call it, with the responsible um, to increase social literacy in Europe, um, across Europe, and one of the, to address that, this informal education, Blue Schools was proposed uh, to try and um, encourage formal education, education uh, institutes and, and communities to, to teach about the ocean. Um, several consultations took place in different countries in, around Europe. Uh, I coordinated the approach here in the UK. Uh, and the lessons we learned um, are wide. Uh, so we were uh, conscious that education systems across Europe are really diverse. So one of the big lessons um, at the end, we, which we kind of knew, is you have to take individual approaches to, depending on the community you're working in. But another really, really strong lesson we learned is that, um, um, and in the previous question, Megan, Celia, and, and we kind of touched on that, is that a key thing of uh, ocean literacy is that you need to make it relevant to, to everyday life. Um, so it's about this connection uh, with the ocean uh, and to make it effective, to make it a successful story, um, you need to know how to tap into making it relevant to, to the people you're trying to engage in. Um, and, um, and also, so Blue Schools at the moment are um, looking for uh, how to, to move on. So different countries came with different um, conclusions. Uh, in the UK, um, there was the conclusion that uh, there's potential, there's appetite, there's flexibility in curricula and in the, the school system, but there needs to be support both of, to pilot uh, something beyond the consultation and also to, to help teachers become confident uh, through either CPD or uh, initial teacher training. Uh, we need to help teachers um, be confident in delivering and making teaching about the ocean just by infusing the curriculum with examples um, throughout uh, and also to, to overcome other challenges. But then you have success stories like in Portugal, who uh, were also one of the Blue Schools countries and they just sailed literally with it. Uh, and uh, they've got um, a network of Blue Schools implemented already in, uh, in the country that is proving really successful with um, dozens of schools signed up because they've got support from ministries and, um, and funding, and they are definitely a very a success story to, for us to follow. And uh, any, like maybe one, one challenge or one thing that we need to work on? Um, so it's, it's addressing the, uh, I think it's, we need to, to be mindful of the diversity of the communities we are working with. So, you know, the, addressing the problem in the UK will be different to how you address it in France or uh, in Portugal or Sweden and so forth. Um, so I think that's, that's a big challenge. We can't just think that we can have a blanket solution for, that will work with everybody. And for this, we need all these creative people like the people in this panel and, uh, and also in the audience um, working together using their creativity who know their communities and who know what are the specific challenges in, in the areas they work, I think. Thank you, Eliane. And uh, I know that when I was talking to some of you, or to, I mean, most of you mentioned that in uh, maybe uh, teachers ha not having enough time or trying to find the way around all the resources that exist, is how we can how we can help that? Is there something that uh, we, we can do in uh, developing our ocean literacy or maybe structuring resources that, again, all of this exists? Is so something that uh, maybe you can comment how we can uh, help them? I don't know anybody would, who could 
comment on that those who have two heads of maybe both uh, uh, teachers and uh, different associations and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking uh, Megan and Jenny maybe one of you can say something I'm happy to uh, to weigh in here so um, something that's I think been useful is really teachers learning from one another and I think like through the associations that's one way um, just sort of sharing what's worked for them and but while still being mindful as Ilian said of um, you know diverse classroom settings and diverse contexts and knowing that you know what works in in my classroom in New York might not work in a classroom in Portugal um, but just getting ideas and things that um, we know are educationally sound and and providing professional development from, from peers, from other educators, I think is critical. Mm -hmm. yeah, I hear that, that uh, the professional development is an, is an issue that uh, already, I think, Elian uh, mentioned that something, how do we do, how do we provide these opportunities for teachers to get to know all these networks and different resources? Is there enough uh, space that exists in the formal and informal network so it depends on the teacher mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. can i just add as well i don't i don't know if you, can you hear me properly <laughs> yeah? yes a little better um, yes oh i'm trying to get closer and be a bit louder um i think the thing that we need to remember as well is that it's not only teachers experience and skills it's the fact that they have a curriculum that they have to deliver and um coming from a uk perspective we don't have one we have four so like Eliane said, one size doesn't fit all. So even within the UK, we have to have slightly different approaches in different, in different countries within the UK, but also in different types of school. So I think there's a piece of work that needs to be done and continue to be done at a policy level, because in the curriculum, yes, there are mentions of OSHA, I'm thinking primary more, more specifically, so the younger children, but they're a lot easier to teach terrestrial content because it hasn't been so traditionally taught or it isn't as explicitly required or we're human beings and we live on the land. So there's a, there's a confidence and comfortable thing, but there's also a requirement thing. And there is so much you have to teach as a teacher that you're going to stick with what you have to do. So there's opportunities to perhaps develop projects and resources that sit outside of the classroom, but in, still in the school. So things for eco groups, things for assembly time when you meet with all of the of all of the students at the same time you know campaigns around the school so there's there's a, there's a gap in the market there for things like that that we can be doing to help help schools and help teachers as well um, but curriculum is, is a big one for me we all need to be working on that i think thank you Junior. i think you brought up a very important uh, issue here of how do we deal with it on the institutional level or, or the is there some policy support or the, 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 the educational reform is needed for this to be more easy for educators to, to find the time, to find uh, uh, the, the means to, to get these issues in, the, in their classrooms. And uh, I think this is a, maybe a, a, a bigger issue and uh, I'm, at least I'm happy we start in it and uh, it's, uh, Maybe in um, in the this year is a is a good year for advancing this issue because, uh, as they say in uh, in the ocean conference in in Malta that the tide is turning now everybody is being on board with a uh, with a different media talking about the, picking up the issues. It's becoming a very big uh, uh, opportunity, I think, to to tackle these issues. What can we do to to change things and um, so yes, I think I have uh, one more minute of your attention. Uh, I don't know if Celia, you want to add something also? Yeah, from, I just wanted uh, to say, yeah, I just wanted to say that um, yeah, the curricula in the UK is so restrictive and they're kind of cutting some creative things from the curriculum. So definitely I wanted to say that this workshop that we're doing, we enter, we offer the art is actually fitting some of the key story, you know, elements that they need to fulfill. So by doing this workshop, they actually provide some of the art skills. So mm -hmm. we're kind of meeting that need rather than necessarily a scientific need. And, and then also the teachers love the cross-curricular element because actually mm -hmm. in primary schools, they can teach lots of different things kind of in one class. 
I just wanted to say that one of the biggest challenges I found was um, offering a solution. I think this was mentioned in the first question. Yeah. We were covering the key story of, of overfishing. It was very easy to teach them about overfishing, but actually to provide a solution, even when brainstormed amongst all the experts, we found it very challenging to actually come up with some very clear messaging. We've also, I mean, I've actually, after quite a lot of research, we, I, I feel like I have found a kind of concise message to give, but I just thought that was very interesting. It was very easy to teach about the problem and less easy to offer a clear actioning um, element to the, to the education thing. Thank you, Celia, for, for this, because it's, I think, brings it back to what Megan was saying, that when we, are, we um, focus uh, on, we, we give the problem, but we then try to work together with the youth, with, with the children, that they are finding the solution and not trying to offer them already pre-made the solution of how to do it. So that if I can sum up... Um, some of the main things I, I heard from you today, and I hope I will also hear a bit more from uh, our audience later on, is that we, um, that there are, of course, differences between the different countries and schools and uh, the way how maybe education policy works in the UK and in uh, America and in, uh, in Europe, in Australia and everywhere. However, the main the challenge that I think all agree is that uh, having to teach uh, ocean issues within the formal education in science is challenging. There's not enough time, there are too many resources. Um, there may be a challenge of um, um, finding the time for educators to go on a professional development, to learn new things, to uh, and to break the, the the sort of barriers between the different sciences, experiment and play themselves with the children, and not to be bound by a certain requirement of the curriculum. The other issue I, I heard you saying, and I, I I hope I got it right, is that we need to give uh, more space for children's in, in, in inquiries because they are natural learners. And, and uh, I think there are several uh, educational programs and systems which build on this when the curriculum is uh, not set by adults, but it's the following the interest of a child. And then you find everything that goes around. You can teach uh, arts, you can teach biology, you can teach uh, History you can teach everything uh, going with the interest of the question that the child asks. If there are more humans or the fish on Earth, or you can teach so many subjects on that. So then, uh, given from that, uh, uh, there are um, few issues that we, well, quite a few issues that we call, can continue discussing. And um, as a, today, I would like now to thank all of the participants, I thank all of the panelists, and uh, to say that this is just the beginning of discussion. And what we try to do is, is to understand whether what we have as a, uh, a, a, the way we teach uh, our children, is it enough? Uh, do, do we need some different needs? Do we need to change something? In, where we get knowledge, what kind of knowledge, uh, is it sufficient what we have or not? And uh, is different ways how we do, uh, some of them successful, some not, many very, very good initiatives, amazing things uh, you all do. And uh, it's um, a question of how do we share, how do we learn from each other? And uh, I would like to encourage you all and thank you all for continuing doing what you're doing and uh, to tell you that our project is looking for also best practices and uh, looking for um, being um, or researching this topic of how do we make uh, everybody, children, families, educators, everybody, everybody has so many hats, be feeling that they are responsible. And I think on this note, I already took your time for more than four minutes, but I hope you enjoyed uh, being with us. And if you think if there are some other questions that we should take on board, 
please uh, let us know either via chat or email or the forum. And um, I think each of each of uh, these webinars we do, like the one with children, can reserve, deserve much more space. So, but I'm happy to hear the main messages. Uh, we will try to take them on board with our project and to engage it with other stakeholders. Thank you very much again. Have a good afternoon and evening, and a good. Uh, uh, year school year i hope you find solutions to all the issues you have and i wish you inspiring wonderful uh, time with kids all Thank the best you.